without further ado, I'm going to introduce Bill Chifredi, who will be speaking on back pain. <coughs> Thanks, Stephanie. How's our, how's our volume? It's okay? Good? I know, and you, you don't get the opportunity to kind of see what's on my screen here. Um, but uh, there, there's one good reason to have the mic this morning, um, which was my voice. So, uh, in addition to our 30th year anniversary for our organization, it was also Ruth's and my 30th year anniversary, um, wedding anniversary. So we, we decided to take um, a few days and go out to, to the southwest and go back to uh, the Grand Canyon, Bryce, and Zion Canyons to do some hiking where when we first went to the kids, they had some new interest. So this is Bright Angel Trail looking down the edge of it here. This is uh, the Grand Canyon, it's a mile deep, it's 277 miles long and about 22 miles wide, north to south. We didn't do the whole north to south, but uh, the first day we got there, it was good weather and forecast to be maybe a couple of good days of weather, but we didn't know what the rest would hold. So um, we decided we'd do as much hiking as we could in the beginning. And um, we started off and <coughs> down Bright Angel was very steep on the way down, and you find your way down through here. And in this section is called Indian Gardens. It's very green and trees and things. And if you continue on down, you might not be able to see this path that goes out to this lift here, which is Plateau Point, where you can see the Colorado River from there. So that's a 12-mile hike round trip, and the last three is coming back up steep switchbacks. Uh, and uh, unless you've done it before, it's this funny thing of, of uh, hiking up when you're doing the second half of your hike. Instead of hiking down the mountain, you're now hiking up, and you're actually going up higher and higher in altitude, which is at 7,500 feet at the south rim. And uh, we were doing fine on the way down and coming on the way back, and then we get to the, the last three miles. and. Uh, my legs were all cramping up, and my heart rate is about 160. And uh, I checked with my wife, who her heart rate was like, I don't know, maybe over 100, just over 100. And just, uh, that's fine, dear. So I do maybe three switchbacks and stop and rest. And she, no, no, that's fine, I'll wait. And that was like the last three miles was that way. So between that and the next six mile hike, I, uh, I got a cold and getting out of bronchitis, and I wasn't sure if I'd be able to speak very well. So Stephanie, ran off and got a mic in case uh, I could speak. So that's the introductory story. <laughs> so as you, um, we've had uh, some, some good speakers this morning uh, with Dr. Ko, arthritis, very common problem for us. Um, and the topic here of treating long-term MS is non-specific back pain because it's a, it's a common thing and, uh, in, in itself. Uh, I changed my topic slightly as Dan completed his, his uh, program that I got to see it, uh, ahead of time. Uh, instead of just the art and science, this is an opportunity. So it's a big opportunity about low back. Um, one of my interests is really in in healthcare and where we're really currently at or the direction that we're going right now in healthcare. And so just looking up the term of wellness in the dictionary, uh, the condition of good physical and mental health, especially when actively maintained by proper diet, exercise, avoiding some risky behavior. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, uh, number two, an approach to healthcare that emphasizes preventing illness and prolonging life as opposed to emphasizing treating diseases. So the word mental was in there once, although things that really relate to uh, uh, proper diet, exercise, uh, uh, and avoiding risky behavior are the standard kinds of things that I think are, we typically think about and are typically touted. Um, and uh, leaving me wondering about the other aspects of things. 
that um, may be important and important in our topic here. So as I looked up further, the World Health Organization says the wellness in healthcare is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Or infirmity. So I just, that seems to fit my own thought process on things. Um, and it's just my curiosity, where is the mental and social well-being aspects of healthcare, healthcare delivery, um, if they are really a fundamental part of wellness. Um, so, part of my interest in this topic was, as I've been doing this work now for 36 years, so the gentleman who had black hair before, there's a lot of years over that, and there's been a real change in, in what I've seen with the people that I've had the opportunity to work with. Certainly, back pain has been one of the most common things that uh, I've treated and that we, we continue to treat here. Uh, I, I took great satisfaction in my earliest years from the standpoint of the person's problem as a biomechanical problem. Um, and the nuts and bolts are things in alignment, or the alignment's not right, is there weakness, things like that. And that I could do something between my hands or exercise and showing them that we could straighten out the biomechanics and they would do really well. And over the course of time, I noticed that there's things are covered more and more with uh, people coming in with other aspects uh, as they arrived with histories of uh, depression or anxiety or panic disorders or sleep disorders uh, that uh, were now more and more um, common elements with the folks that uh, I would see. So uh, here is a um, picture of four uh, individuals and I. what's common to me is talking to people, hey, how are you doing? And the, the very more common response is, oh good, I'm busy, really busy, which is kind of code for overwhelm. And uh, that's been a lot of changes from when I first started my practice. Uh, I had the original Mac, the original computer Mac, which was used for word processing. Everything else was done with pen and paper. Cell phones didn't exist. The internet didn't exist. There's been a lot of changes in that time in our in our culture. So people would know that we had four kids, and you might must be really busy. And it's like, well, yeah, it is busy. It's pretty rich. But uh, as I think about those things that that Dr. Rourke was talking about, they um, they come and speak to me. So I really had to learn to modify treatment to also address what were really the non-biomechanical problems of things. And so the stress and anxiety is just is very common. And things that are uh, other aspects such as sleep and diet and lifestyle are all um, other very important things as well. And as it relates to just the comments I'll make in this little half hour talk, many of those things also can be related to issues of stress and anxiety. So I'm just going to put my focus there just because we have to keep the discussion a little narrow. Um, but this was, as far as the pertinence, this is the Valley News Wednesday, October 21st of this year. New Hampshire releases monitoring data on drugs. Info sheds light on volume of addictive prescriptions. Uh, and it says that more than half of the doses prescribed between October 2014 to June 2015 were for prescription pain medication, while others included anti-anxiety medication, etc. So that was consistent with what I've been experiencing over my career and um, things that are important to actually be able to address on some level if we're going to be at least as effective, if not more effective, in helping people that have back pain. 
So, what's this, this opportunity in here? Um, in thinking about Dan's discussion, uh, I wanted to think about, well, you know, what is it that we can do that helps us to be more positive? Is it just in the genes or, or what? And, uh, you know, as I, as I had thought through working with folks um, in the last hundred years, I felt like, well, you know, if, if we really help people get control of their pain problem and they develop their own confidence that they can handle that, well, maybe, maybe that confidence will spread into other aspects of their life. And to me, that was a much bigger reward and a, a bigger impact if we actually can have that kind of impact. So that's where my interest has really come from. So when we look at um, things like uh, confidence and confidence, uh, they're, uh, they become essential elements in considering how do we deal with um, these issues. I know some of my notes are, are missing at the bottom. So um, when you think about uh, the New England Patriots, not that everything has to be a, a sports story here, but uh, you, you're watching this season, and as far as being competent, they seem to have uh, their skills and their abilities down. And at the same time, uh, I think a lot of people might agree that if you're playing against the Patriots right now, even if you're ahead, you may not feel like uh, you're really out of the woods because there almost is a sense that they can come back at any time because they, they just they can just do it. That's the confidence aspect of things. Um, there was an interesting uh, interview with uh, Novak Djokovic, who is the number one tennis player in the world, and for a long time he 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 was highly skilled um, at the beginning, but he was not number one. He was behind. Federer and behind um, uh, Rafa Nadal and, and a couple other guys. And he just wasn't there. And when he finally got up to being number one and they interviewed him and said, well, Novak, what, what really changed for you? And he said, you know, I, I think I had these other people too much on a pedestal. I, I, I didn't have myself up there. And so to me, that was the issue of, of his own self-confidence. So you can be highly skilled at something, but if you don't have the confidence about it, it still makes a big difference. So from my experience and my viewpoint, those two things are very important. So looking at competence, uh, just a definition, a specific ability or skill, and uh, the element of prediction is that to the degree that we're really competent, really the more skilled, the more competent we are at something, then the more we're going to be able to predict the outcome because we, yeah, I've done that. I've done that every time I do it, oh, yeah, it works out. Nine out of ten times it works out, so the better we are, it becomes more of a predictive value. And confidence is the belief in oneself and one's power and abilities. And that comes to some degree, I think, with the, the ability to do things and have a number of successes. Without getting into things too deep, obviously you have to be able to to experience a failure and not let it throw you. To be able to try again, try again, try again, and so that those kind of things add up, where you have enough wins that you develop your confidence. So, to me, part of this stuff is is a process. Um, the key points about how we address people here that really have low back pain as it relates to these other factors is our success is going to be addressing the most influential elements that are both biomechanical ones and the non-biomechanical ones. And that part is really the art and the application of the science of what we do here. So as far as prevalence of back pain, we heard about how prevalent arthritis is. So back pain very common health problem worldwide and a major cause of disability. Um, the onset of low back pain remains obscure, the diagnosis difficult to make. 
<coughs> so we have this kind of conundrum here where it's very common and yet it's, it's kind of a big unknown, black box about what is it? You know, what is the what is the real um, cause of it? So with the natural history, back pain occurs in about 80% of the people. Um, within six weeks, 90% or so, most of the episodes resolve regardless of treatment. So that's how they look at things. And yet, despite this, this issue and this observation, it, the you know, World Health Organization talks about how huge a disability it is and how big a deal it is. So what's going on here? So there are some reasons that I think are, are logical reasons for why does this thing persist. And we're talking about back pain and oftentimes this nonspecific back pain is people that have arthritis. But you might think about this as other kinds of um, areas that people may have arthritis uh, as uh, reasons for pain. But if we think about abnormal postures as a signature of abnormal movement patterns, or abnormal movement patterns, that uh, people that have abnormal postures are putting abnormal tension on different tissues and structures that, for the moment, might be, I don't feel a thing. I, I, I mean, I have great posture, but uh, I'm not hurting. And yet, then, when they get injured, then, the injury sensitizes the tissues that are on stress because of these abnormal postures and movement patterns, and then the pain persists and it doesn't go away. So that's one of the elements that can be about the reason why someone's pain persists. So it can be an incomplete or delayed resolution. And we have good ways of handling that in our profession. So here you have uh, very common element here. Uh, we all might think of ourselves as, yeah, this, I could probably improve my posture. People that sit like this all the time, they don't all necessarily hurt. Um, one of the right is a better posture. And yet, when that person then has an injury or an insult, um, then, then that posture may be part of what continues to cause their pain to remain. Similarly, with this, this is quite the get up here. Um, that's not a great posture, but that person may be a person that they, they have no symptoms at all. They get a little whiplash, which might not even be very severe. It doesn't damage the car much at all, and yet then the pain in their back persists because they really have lost some of the normal curves and some of the muscles are on constant tension that at the moment weren't hurting before, but now they continue to hurt and they don't go away. Uh, another reason that pain can persist can be maladaptive movement patterns. So with this, um, I just simply wanted to, to use some kind of example where once we have pain, it's not uncommon that we start moving differently. So adaptive movement patterns that then become a source of stress and strain because we've changed something on how we've done it, and it's not a good strategy. So people that, some people that have injured their back, and now from, from now on to, to bend over and pick something up, it's really, it's something like this, or uh, I don't know, but I think I'm gonna have to do it like this, because I'm supposed to bend my hips and knees, and, uh, and they never do restore their just normal movement to pick something up without hesitation, without guarding. <coughs> so these other kinds of muscle guarding um, and uh, abnormal movement patterns as a result of the pain, as a response to the pain, can then be another reason why the pain persists. So the National Institute of Health causes of back pain Comment is mechanical problems, injuries, acquired conditions, infections, and tumors. And although the causes are, are usually physical 
emotional stress can play a, a role in how severe pain is and how long it lasts. So again, that's the thing, one of the things that I've observed in my career over a long time that is really changing, <coughs> changing our culture. So if we look at anxiety, and I, I pulled up this definition uh, that says anxiety, a general term for several disorders that cause nervousness, fear, apprehension, and worrying. Um, can affect how we feel, how we behave, that might manifest in real physical symptoms. On the right hand side, anxiety disorders may be caused by environmental factors, medical factors, genetics, brain chemistry, substance abuse, or a combination of them. It's most commonly triggered by the stress in our lives. Usually anxiety is a response to outside forces. When I read that, then um, it made me a little anxious. <laughs> as, I, as I read that and look at it, you know, I get the sensation that I don't really have any control over it. It's something that it might happen because of all these other factors, um, maybe my genetics, which is our children always use that when they do something that's not right or it's not accomplished right. It's like, oh, it must be your genes, Dad. Um, but it may be all these factors outside of somebody and doesn't relate to them. And if that is the case, that makes it quite different. It's quite difficult to actually um, live your life the way you want to live it. I think about that. I think about Dr. Rewards talk about being positive. It's like, well, if, I, if I really believe that myself, I, might, I think I'm going to be afraid that I'm going to be afraid. Things that bother you know, people that have anxiety or panic attacks are very safe. So it's not um, meant to minimize this. It is, um, it is that I, I look at it differently in the sense of well, what can I do about it to help people out? Or what can people do about it to help it out? So looking a little further when I look at this uh, in, in, a, in a different definition here, it says of the apprehension of fear, um, signs as, such as sweating and tension and increased pulse, by doubt concerning the reality and the nature of the threat, and by self-doubt about one's capacity to cope with it. So that was very important to me. And those things are things that I can grasp and I can do something about. Think about it, anxiety being uncertain threat or uncertain ability needed to handle the threat. <clears throat> things like knowledge and skill are things that would have to be used to address that. And if you listen to Dr. Coe this morning, you heard him say that one of the important things that they're finding is that giving their patients knowledge, more knowledge, is they're finding being very important for them in finding uh, the uh, better result or better satisfaction with their care for arthritis. And the other aspect with the anxiety, don't know if one is capable to handle it. So I'm really anxious, I don't know. That's a lack of confidence, right? Now, in, in our realm of physical therapy, you think of you know, really four major things we can do. So it's like, that's all we can do, four major things. It has a lot of details to it, but basically, um, if things are weak, we can strengthen them. If things are stiff, we can mobilize them. <coughs> if things are unstable, then we can help to stabilize them. Um, and uh, most important, we can educate them. So, those are the things that we can do, and uh, our success, especially in dealing with low back pain, but really dealing with all things that we care for here, is that care must be individualized. So the challenge with that a little bit right now in our healthcare delivery system is that 
there is an, there is an effort to ensure that we um, don't over treat people and that uh, we, we don't spend longer with them than we really need to because we have to save money. Um, and uh, there's sometimes a caution to looking at all the, the studies to try to pee -pee, uh, treat people with evidence-based medicine in a very similar way. And so while evidence-based medicine is a noble thing, the right thing, from our viewpoint and our success, it's because of the individualization that we provide because each person comes to us quite different. So, the strengthening, there are exercises um, that are part of developing strength around those areas that are weak. Um, you notice that one of the exercises on the right is a little more basic. This one's a lot more advanced, right? Uh, we can mobilize things. So, we mobilize joints. We help mobilize tight muscles with stretching um, manually or with exercise. Stabilizing things might be through specific exercises where someone's problem is that they have a little less stability. So the focus is on um, providing stability training or sometimes supports temporarily. And education. So, um, knowledge about this person, here's ergonomic issues. So somebody may have a back pain problem and if one of the reasons their back pain is persisting is because the way they do their work all day takes them into really uh, mechanically stressful positions, it's going to be important to educate them. So this person just basically they're, they're sitting erect and upright, um, they have things where they can reach them and that's part of what we what we also do <coughs> often in our clinic is be able to help people look at their their work environment to help reorganize that for them if that's part of the education of it. The person's got a smile on their face, right? So they must have been listening to Dan. An <laughs> uh, example on the uh, on the right is goes back to the movement patterns that I was mentioning before. If somebody has faulty movement patterns, whether it be because of uh, some habit that they've had for a long time, or something as a response to the pain, then our education and training with them about how to move differently then becomes an important part of the educational piece that we have for people that's necessary for their success. So every person doesn't kind of get the rope thing. They don't get to join the gym and just become very strong and um, take three classes and do the same thing because what's necessary and helpful for one person may be quite different than the other. So the knowledge aspect of things for people with back pain and where we just said, gee, they don't feel like they really know to a great deal what's always the cause of someone's back pain. First of all, it's helpful for people to know if we see them, they may be coming to us and they, they want to know, what, can, you, can you tell me what, you know, what's causing my problem? Sometimes it's very helpful for them to know, first of all, that back pain is really common. Um, and it, it's, I don't think it's any more common now than it was uh, you know, a century ago. But um, it doesn't mean it has to be debilitating. Most everybody has it sometime or another, and most people, their pain goes away. And there are people that I uh, have seen that have had pain for, they, they get the picture in their mind that it's going to be forever because as they get older, um, then it's going to get worse because they have a degenerative condition, that word that, that they've heard, and that I'm going to get older and the things are going to degenerate further, so I it's just going to be worse. I'm going to live with this for the rest of my life, and it's just going to get worse. And it's not the case. Um, that uh, Many older people, you talk to them, and it's like, yeah, I had this episode of pain for a while. There's a whole year that you know really had, had gotten me down. And, uh, no, that's gone. I don't have that anymore. 
And it's helpful for people to know that, you know, it's not the case that you're, you're not necessarily going to live with pain the rest of your life because of that. It's helpful for them to know that MRIs and x-rays aren't good predictors of pain or the prognosis. So one of the questions I had with, with Dr. Koh, I didn't want to hold him up afterwards, but it's great, Dr. Koh. So, you know, we know that many people have arthritis. If they have arthritis in their knees, somebody may have um, a, a moderate or small amount of arthritis, and yet they're really debilitated. There's a lot of pain, they're limited. The next person has uh, a terrible arthritic knee, bone on bone. Um, and yet, they get along fine. They're not complaining. It's, it's not interfering with their life. They're continuing to walk for an hour. Um, and he had mentioned about somebody on the way out to talk. He said, yeah, and this guy was just getting through a 20 mile. So it's helpful for people to know that um, what they see on films and x-rays, that doesn't really dictate their life at all. So an important part for us is a gradient approach to the exercise, the movements, um, and the retraining. And this speaks to the ability to develop someone's skill or to develop their confidence. It requires um, going from more basic movements to more complex movements. And on a gradient that's appropriate for the individual, so that that varies um, largely with each person on um, what they need. Um, what's a, a very important part of it in our success is that this gradient approach, and to to be able to achieve um, their level of skill or their level of confidence is what you heard Dr. Rourke say, practice. It requires working at something and doing it over and building up on it, and being successful, and having small successes build on other successes, and uh, the ability to develop somebody's confidence because they're having successes through the process. So there's there can be a tendency in our healthcare delivery system to look at the information and the evidence and say, well, most people's pain goes away. The other people, we don't really know what causes their pain. And uh, so it's important for people to just to get on with their life. I'll give you a book. I'll show you a couple of exercises and read the book and get on with your life and try to be positive. So that sounds good, but the success for us is being able to take a person and walk them through whatever process and length of time they need, and what gradient they need, so that they experience the successes, that they experience the ability to develop competence in something that they own, that's theirs, so that they develop their confidence about themselves. And that's a different picture than the sense of being stressed or being anxious about the condition that you have um, and being in a place where you feel like, oh, yeah, I have arthritis in my back, or I, I had a uh, herniated disc before, and uh, I managed it, and I got through it. And as Dan said, we all experience things in life that are challenges, and it's really a matter of how we respond to them. So, um, for me, it's the gradient approach. It's the perseverance through the work to do that, to have someone help you along the way to do that in order to develop the skill and the confidence to be successful with that. So, just a couple of cases as an example. A gentleman that uh, I've treated recently in his later 70s, he had spinal surgery at a very young age and had a fusion in his back. So in, in his young age, you can imagine the technique and those things were really not as refined as they are today. Um, and uh, the person had been in a situation where he wasn't able to 
do the usual walking and, and live his usual lifestyle, and his back pain flared up. So the treatment for this individual, it was some uh, soft tissue work on the muscles that had gone into to spasm and um, and it got intense and, and um, painful to help normalize them, increase the circulation, improve some flexibility of some muscles that also attach around the back that had gotten stiff because of <coughs> sitting a lot more and not walking as much. Um, and then correcting some of the faulty movement patterns. So the slide you saw the person um, bending over like this was his tendency to do that because of of tightness in certain muscle groups and fusion in his back. And for a tall gentleman to be able to wash his face at the sink, it was simple things like that were continuing to be painful and required just some education and training of those movement patterns for him. And then reestablish himself getting back out to walk. That was a very important part of his, his care. So he goes out and he walks for an hour, he has a very arthritic knee, bone on bone, although the walk doesn't bother his knee. And it's part of what keeps his back um, happy. So there's the educational piece um, on his movement patterns. Walking is a very important part of, uh, of an element for uh, people that have back pain problems and for people that don't have back pain problems. It's a very important part of of fundamental health. It encourages a rhythmical movement um, at the torso, and so muscles get to, re to uh, activate and relax. It mobilizes the spine and keeps the joints lubricated. It encourages rhythmical expansion and relaxation of um, the chest wall. And so our, our lymphatic system, which is the system that drains toxins from the blood, is that system that doesn't have a, a, a pump like the heart and it's the root cage expanding and contracting that helps pump that to help detoxify ourselves. Um, and the other aspect that um, I look at for my folks is when you go out for a walk, go out and look around, be where you are. So I encourage people to look at the environment and be where they are. There are some people that use their walk to solve problems. And if your mindset is positive and you're walking around and you're thinking you're, you're in dance camp now where you're a positive person, you might be thinking, well, I'm going to fix this and I'm going to create this and I'm going to change this in the bathroom and I'm going to fix this problem at work. Or you might be the person that you ruminate and you just start thinking about all the problems <coughs> in your life and what's not going right and you just can't, can't help it. That's the person in particular that I really encourage. Look out, look at the things around you. Did you notice the trees out there? Did you notice the birds? That, yeah, the birds are leaving town. Did you notice the things around you? Because that's getting outside of yourself. And one of the challenges for folks that have pain all the time is they get focused on their pain. Sorry, Stephanie, you're, you're my model for this, but <laughs> the idea of, in our culture today, of the um, person walking off to class to their mindfulness class <laughs> as they're checking out their email. So it's just a funny scene in my head that it's part of our culture that we, that we struggle with or live in. Um, in the last case is just someone who, uh, office worker, 30s, had constant pain for a year. Um, he had some unsuccessful um, attempts at some other treatments. This person, a very important part of their success was stretching out and mobilizing a lot of muscle that was, was very tight and stiff and a big part of the source of their pain. And also because of their pain, they really didn't move and exercise much. So the focus for that person is, um, flexibility, getting the muscles around the area mobile, um, restoring their ability to bend backwards because they've lost that mobility, and then to get out and walk 30 45 minutes, which they had restarted again, and were really happy to do so and just needed 
the encouragement and the hand-holding to get back on track. They also um, had an interest in the nutritional concept themselves. So we were able to provide that for them as well so that it could help to reduce their weight. And uh, again, the, the package for the treatment for that person was individualized. So, key point for us, individualized care means caring, and um, for us it means delivering the care from building a strong relationship. Um, as you heard Dr. Co mentioning earlier this morning, if you were here about that element, that's a very important element. So the empathy, the acknowledging of somebody, the validating of who they are, and allowing them to be who they are, uh, so that you can be in communication with them. Uh, and then the education, addressing whatever pertinent biomechanical factors there are, and then whatever pertinent non-biomechanical factors there are for them, and go and train them for their confidence <coughs> and their confidence. Develop a strong level of skill and ability, develop a belief in yourself and your abilities. So the opportunity with this and this low back pain, um, establish the confidence and confidence in one's self that reinforce a positive attitude. Um, follow up with, with Dan's comments, seek and surround yourself with positive people. If you're in an environment where the people you're with are constantly looking at what's wrong in life or what's wrong with you, not that my thought would go into the presidential debates, but <laughs> um, it's not very helpful um, in, um, in our health if we're surrounded by the, our closest people that are like that. Um, involve yourself with creative activity. If you're creating and you're thinking outside of yourself, gotcha, then um, you are uh, you're moving outside of yourself and not looking inward at the pain. <coughs> Encourage movement, walk, and that's Zion Candy. So thank you for your time today. Um, we all appreciate your um, the opportunity to have you come and, and uh, visit with us on our anniversary. Um, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I'm happy to talk with anybody afterwards. <laughs>